We are coming on the air with a CBS News special report. I'm Nora O'Donnell in Washington. We have just learned some breaking news from Kensington Palace in London. The Princess of Wales, Kate Middleton, revealing that she has been diagnosed with cancer and is undergoing chemotherapy. And now the dreaded news from London and Kensington Palace that the Princess of Wales has cancer. As she revealed there that she underwent major abdominal surgery in London at the time they thought it was not cancer. They released that publicly. But now uh, Catherine is saying that in the tests afterward, they did discover that there was cancer and that they have advised her to undergo a course of preventive chemotherapy. That started in late February. You can only imagine uh, what this is like for a young mother. She is 42 years old, a mom to George, 10, Charlotte, 8, Louis, uh, five. She has not been seen since Christmas Day. That was nearly three months ago. And at the time, it was thought that she was recovering from this abdominal surgery. But of course, uh, in many days, the speculation has grown about her health, the concern about the Princess of Wales, 42 years old, and of course, her husband, uh, William, who lost his mother at the age of 15, Princess Diana, and of course the king undergoing treatment as well now for cancer. Let's bring in senior foreign correspondent Charlie Daggett. He is in London, and Charlie, as we heard the princess say, this has come as a huge shock to them, and I can only imagine for the people there, too, processing this news. Yeah, well, we just got news just a few minutes ago that this was going to happen. It was a two-minute 15 um, a presentation, as it were. Uh, it, was, it was filmed two days ago. Uh, as, as far as the palace is concerned, they've given us some information. They say she's in good spirits. Uh, she's focused on her recovery. Uh, she's hugely grateful to the medical team uh, for the, the care that they're providing. She now needs time, space, and privacy to complete her treatment and make a full recovery. So, as you say, we don't know which cancer or when it was diagnosed um, or even when the treatment began specifically. And they told us to stay away from speculation and guessing those dates. Now, as for the timing of the announcement itself, the palace told us they wanted to wait until Easter break, and that's today, when the children are out of school. Um, they wanted time to reassure uh, the children that she's going to be okay. And now they've just asked uh, for media to refrain from chasing up further medical details and to restrain from further speculation. The family may attend church on Sunday, but for any public events, it's hard to know when Kate's going to be back or when she'll be given the green light. I understand that Kensington Palace has given some information to reporters. What did the palace say when asked what type of cancer this is? Yeah, well, I'm just reading right off the statement that they gave us. They said, once post-operative tests have been completed and results were reviewed, uh, as for guidance, they're not going to confirm specific dates, and they're asking the media not to speculate. So they really both, what Kate had to say and what the palace had to say are both in line, that it was not diagnosed at the time of her abdominal surgery. Uh, it was since diagnosed, but we don't know when that diagnosis uh, took place, or we don't know when the preventative chemotherapy, as they describe it, began. But as you said, you know, there's been so much speculation. She's been out of the public eye for so many months. Uh, there is questions about that image that was released. Everybody's been worried, really, um, about uh, her well-being. So in one way, this will help clear up some of the confusion, but it's also going to raise concerns here about her well-being. Charlie Daggett, stand by. I want to bring in our chief medical correspondent, Dr. John LaPook, who joins us now. And Dr. LaPook, I mean, this is the worst news for anyone when they learn about this themselves, for their family members. And of course, um, Princess Catherine is so young, 42, with young children. And of course, she does have a right to privacy. When you read the statement and what the palace has revealed, what were your thoughts? Well, first of all, um, it was a big surprise because we had, we had been told that it was not cancerous. And of course, our hearts go out to Kate and to her family and, and, and all the people around her. Um, I will say there is one 
thing that, you know, I wondered about specifics, of course. What kind of cancer is it? The, the devils are in the details. Um, as a gastroenterologist, again, they asked us not to speculate, but I do wonder about the gastrointestinal tract, um, you know, the, the colon or the small intestine, and less likely to me would be something uh, gynecologic, but you, you always have to consider that or even something else. But I will tell you something that was sort of relatively encouraging to me, Nora, which is, they went in there and they were surprised after the fact. So that's, you always want to find cancer in the earliest stages. They went in there to do whatever procedure they were going to do, uh, and they knew it was going to be some prolonged recovery. And in there, when presumably they were able to take a good look, they didn't see any evidence of cancer. And it was only afterwards when I guess there maybe was an examination of a specimen, a surgical specimen, that they said, oh, there's some cancer here. So since you always want to find cancer in the earliest stages, whatever kind of cancer it is, to me that was a sort of a relatively good piece of news. Yes, and the palace did speak with reporters off camera. Reporters did ask, what stage of cancer was it? And uh, they're not sharing information about that stage of cancer because they say the princess has a right to privacy. I do want to ask you on that note, because they said she began preventive chemotherapy in late February. What does that mean? Well, you know, I'm just going to give it for example. For example, with colon cancer, we don't know that that's what this is, but I'm going to give that as an example. If it's, um, unless it's at the very, very earliest stages, it's typical to give what's called adjuvant chemotherapy, which you usually, you know, at least here, it can change from place to place. It's three months of chemotherapy, various combinations. It could be pills plus an IV. Um, and the idea is, well, maybe there are some tiny microscopic cells somewhere and we don't want to give them a chance to grow up. We want to nail them right now when they're, when they're not yet you know, clumped together and growing into big masses. So it, it, when you talk about preventive, it's, not real, it's really treatment, right? So it's a confusing term. But you're preventing the uh, growth of whatever microscopic cells are out there uh, in the future. And let me ask you about that. If you're undergoing, just generally speaking, that type of preventive chemotherapy, how does it affect someone? You know, it, it can certainly, you know, make you tired. It can have side effects for sure. But I just got off the phone uh, with a cancer expert uh, from NYU Langone Health, where I'm a professor of medicine. And he said, yeah, it can be a rough three months or so, if, let's say, for example. Um, but then people tend to have 100% recovery afterwards in terms of getting their strength back and getting back to normal function. So I'm, you know, I'm an optimist, a, a realist, too. I wish I had more information, but I understand her desire for, for privacy. And uh, look, the fact that it was found so early and that they kind of tripped on it, they were surprised by it, uh, even though we're shocked by it and she was shocked by it, in the big picture, it's actually relatively encouraging that it was found so early. And we're doing that balancing act as we always do, right? We really don't want to speculate. We want to respect her privacy, but they're coming out and saying it's cancer. And I think, you know, cancer is a terrifying word to people. And my own personal feeling is the more information that you would have here, the more, uh, more assurance you can give to people, and, and including her children and other people, that look, yes, it's cancer. It was a terrifying word, much more terrifying, I think, 30, 40 years ago. But there are so many treatments. There's so many many great ways of taking care of it. There can be excellent prognosis. And if we knew more, we may be able to say, boy, this prognosis really is quite good. Of course, I don't want to be Pollyanna here. It's a serious diagnosis. But I think uh, the more information we would have, the better context we could all put it in. Charlie, why is the palace only sharing this information now? Yeah, well, that was the question that came out in the very, very short briefing before this was released. And it says here from the palace, the princess wanted to share this information when she said she and the prince felt it was right for them as a family. And once again, I told you this is the Easter break, right? So it means that the, the family can come together. There will be a break from the kids having to go back to school. Uh, so they wanted to be able to, to reassure the children, as you mentioned there. Um, it was important for Her Royal Highness to have the time and space to come to terms with her diagnosis to recover from surgery and then begin, and I repeat it again, the pathway to recovery. Those are the words that they're using. Uh, the children had been the priority. They wanted to be able to tell the three children when the time was right, allow them to understand and process the news before it went public. So now, as I said, the children now away from school on the Easter holidays. Royal Highnesses feel it's the right time to share this update. And once again, they're asking for understanding, for putting the children's needs before the public. This is a, a good place to ask you, Charlie, about sort of the appetite 
for information, uh, Charlie, if you're with us still. Um, you know, as Holly points out, it is not an apples to apples comparison uh, when you talk about, for instance, the, the Hollywood celebrities that Holly's mentioning and then the royals who have mm. obviously clearly very different roles in our, our respective societies. But in terms of just the public's uh, desire for information there, can you give us a sense of what that's like? Uh, what is that appetite for information about the royals like? It, it has been relentless, voracious. And it's been that way for a few months, and it's been building up. So let me remind you of that timeline. So Kensington Palace confirmed the Princess of Wales left hospital on January 29th. Now, two months ago, uh, according to this, uh, she began treatment in late February. Uh, the, Prince of, the Prince of Wales had to pull out of a memorial service for his godfather on the 27th. Then came that photoshopped photo, and they had to explain that. They had to apologize. The princess apologized herself for it. So in the meantime, there's been this buildup of where's Kate? What's going on with Kate? Is Kate okay? We knew she had major abdominal surgery. And it's, it's, it's a curiosity. Uh, the uh, social media hasn't helped at all because, as Holly said, you know, the number of conspiracy theories that we've seen about this. And it may just be, of course, they wanted to deal with it on their own, especially when it comes to their children, which they want to be very protective of. And William, very protective of Kate. But it might stand to reason that the the demand to know what's going on may have forced them to say, look, we finally have to come clean with this. It, it wouldn't have been an easy decision to make. And you saw how uncomfortable she looked doing it. Um, yeah, it's a tough thing. You know, this, this is a family at heart. And but the, the British expectations, the tabloids in particular, Nearly every single day they've been going after it. Was this a sighting of Kate? And why isn't she making a public appearance? What is the palace trying to hide? So this is the kind of demand for information. And yes, they are public figures, but it's also a private family dealing with, as John LePouc said, you know, the big C. And that's, that's a tough one. Yeah, and, and let me ask you, Dr. LePouc, uh, you know, on that point, um, it is impossible to imagine, I think, for most people what that white hot spotlight of attention must feel like at any given time where Charlie is talking about one's every move is being sort of scrutinized. The absence of, your, uh, of, of you being out in the public is something that is very much noticed. Can you just talk uh, from your own experience treating patients who mm -hmm. have been diagnosed and their families the emotional impact right. that that can have. Because uh, as Charlie was saying, as Holly was saying, you know, this is a wife, this is a mother, in addition to being Catherine, the Princess of Wales. Uh, she is a person who must be dealing with the tremendous personal emotional weight of not only her title, but then her role in her own family. Right. I'm not surprised that Holly, with her enormous emotional intelligence and compassion, pointed out first that she is a human being. Mm -hmm. This is a human being, she is a mother, she is a person. So yes, the public wants to know this, maybe it's a teaching moment, we'd like more details. Uh, the doctor in me, the optimistic doctor in me thinks, wow, it was found early, if we knew a little more, maybe people would feel better if we could explain exactly how it happened, what was that initial surgery, and all of those details. But then there's the person, she's a human being. And you, you think about the word empathy here, right? Because what I see with patients who go through anything, it could be, by the way, open heart surgery. It could be major abdominal surgery. It could be suddenly finding out they have cancer. That you're in that fight flight mode at the beginning. Your adrenaline's going, your cortisol's going, you gotta do this, that, and the other thing. And then you're sort of on a better path and things may be, you may be recovering. And then literally I've had patients two o'clock in the morning bolt up in the bed in a cold sweat weeks or months later and be surprised by the thought of, oh my gosh, that happened. You know, that was a bullet that just went by my head, even if, you, if it turned out fine. And then we all know that there's mortality. We all know that someday we're going to die. But there is that little thought, maybe, just maybe, I am the first person who's not going to die. There's, you know, especially younger people sure. think that. So that first old. brush with mortality if that's what this is. Um, I don't know what happened to her mm -hmm. in her life before that, but that can be very destabilizing. Mm -hmm. And I think 
I would love for, I would, if I could have a wish, I'd love for everybody to back off, give her her privacy, let her recover. There's going to be a medical, surgical recovery, recovery from the surgery and the wounds there, but there's going to be a longer psychological recovery. And that's going to be very difficult to do under the bright lights. Um, Holly, I'm curious about, uh, obviously, as this news begins to sort of permeate, right, because it is now evening uh, in London, um, what would we expect to see in terms of other potential disclosures of information now that we have had some kind of, you know, very, um, in some ways specific, but in some ways leaves other questions unanswered um, statement, is there potentially... Um, you know, follow-up, any kind of other... I mean, do we have a sense? I suppose this is uncharted territory. Oh, it's a really interesting point, though, Elaine. Yeah. I mean, as you know, as I think we all know, the British royal family has this strange, fractious mm -hmm. uh, relationship with the media, but in particular the tabloid media, the kind right. of powerful tabloid newspapers in the UK. And on the one hand, the royal family kind of needs the newspapers because it's this saying that, you know, you have to be seen to be believed if you're the royal family. They kind of need that coverage to stay relevant. Um, but on the other hand, the newspapers sell papers, get clicks online with royal coverage, but they can choose whether it's positive coverage or negative coverage. I mean, one person who can tell you a lot about that is Meghan Markle, yes, who suffered right. the negative coverage, right? So on the one hand, I think that the British media is going to be searching for any details that they can get about this. And people... You know, the public in Britain wants more details. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, they are dealing with an immensely popular person here, mm -hmm. a person who, you know, only joined the royal family in recent years. She's married into the royal family, but she is really loved. And I think people's hearts have gone out to her in the UK. I think, I think my sense is that there's been less of the kind of rumours and conspiracy theories coming from the UK and more just sympathy for her position. So if the media chases those details too hard or reveals things that are considered private, um, I think that they run the risk of really, you know, angering the, the British public. Yeah. I do think that if it's limited chemotherapy, adjuvant chemotherapy for several months, you know, I said, for example, for colon cancer, it's about three months. You know, people can feel lousy during that. And afterwards, they tend to recover. So I think time will tell. We should be, we're about, with the end of February when they started, so we're already at the end of March. Mm -hmm. Got another couple of months, maybe, maybe it'll end it in, in, I don't know, but in, in three months. Uh, in a total of three months, and then she should recover quickly. And appearances are important in the world, right? She'll start to have more color. She'll gain some weight. She'll look better to everybody. And then hopefully people will move on and she'll do well. It, it, all of this, Charlie, uh, if you're still with us, is happening at a time as the royal family uh, is also uh, is basically coming on the heels of the news of King Charles and his, his own cancer remind us about that and the disclosure that happened at that time. Because uh, when that happened, uh, I think a lot of folks were genuinely surprised at the level of detail provided then about the king. Share with you, speaking of King Charles, this came from Buckingham Palace. Buckingham Palace spokesman saying, His Majesty King Charles is so proud of Catherine for her courage in speaking as she did. Following their time in hospital, uh, His Majesty remained in closest contact with his beloved daughter-in-law throughout the past weeks. Both their majesties will continue to offer their love and support to the whole family through this difficult time. So the king and queen, the first message that we got from Buckingham Palace about that. But as you said, yes, King Charles has been dealing with his own uh, cancer diagnosis and treatment. And when we heard that, in fact, I was working that night when we broke the news, it was shocking enough, not only that something like that was taking place, the announcement itself, but the way it was going to be shared. You know, in the past, even w with um, his mother, they would have been reluctant to share those sort of medical details. And something that would shock the world, as Dr. LePouc said, we use the word cancer, it's a shocking thing to say. So we had King Charles say it. We were surprised that uh, he had come out and not given so much sort of granular detail, again, as far as what kind of cancer, what the treatment was, how long it's going to take. And then to see Kate do the same thing. So, yeah, the this, this family's going through a tough time. Very difficult time. Well, I want to say thank you, Charlie Dagada, Holly Williams, Dr. John LaPook. Thank you all so much for sharing your reporting and your insight with us.
I want to bring in Erin Vanderhoof now. She is a staff writer for Vanity Fair and the co-host of Vanity Fair's Dynasty podcast. Erin, thanks very much for being with us. So let's talk about the timing of this disclosure. Why do you think the palace decided to go public now? Well, one thing that we know is that uh, the Prince and Princess of Wales children will be off on Easter break starting this weekend. And so they will be able to sort of, you know, not be in, around other students when this news comes out, because I know that this is a thing that both William and, you know, Prince Harry have said in the past is that like, you know, being around other students when like big news about your family comes out is really stressful. So. So we're thinking that's the reason. Yeah. And I wonder if you could just give us a sense of the intense, you know, appetite for information. Why has there been, you think, so much fascination with this particular story? Well, I think that there is a sense that when Kate, you know, when we went from seeing Kate nearly every day in the year of 2023 to not seeing her at all, that something, you know, it, it felt a little bit more serious than we understood. And I think that there's a, a you know, maybe a bet of British, British understatement that can go out in palace palace statement sometimes. And, mm -hmm. that, you know, I think that the sense that something more serious was going on felt pretty universal. But just, you know, I think in the U.S. press, we're used to kind of asking questions and getting answers. And the palace. <laughs> Does yes, not always we are operate or like trying that. And at think, least to have yeah. the opportunity to yes. ask the questions. Yes. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing about the palace is that they they treat American and UK media super, super, super differently. And so I think the idea that the UK press didn't seem to be freaking out when there were no answers, I think, was very, very discomfitting to American readers. Yeah. And I wonder um, if you can talk a bit about that, though, because we know that uh, perhaps not the mainstream press was was clamoring that we know online there was a clamoring for information that resulted in a lot of disinformation um, and, and, and rumors sort of floating around and that the absence of any details uh, seemed to be part of the context anyway um, for this. How significant is it that the palace actually had uh, the princess sit down and record this video and then release it uh, to the public like this? Well, I mean, I think that in general, we are seeing it's we're in a new era for royal transparency. And I think it's, it, you know, as we've been seeing, like, it's not always been enough for our, for us, but at the same time, it's more transparent than they've ever been in the past. And I think that there is this idea that Kate really does, you know, when she does talk about things, she's not, she does not love to give speeches. It's a thing she doesn't do super often, but when she has something meaningful to say, she does like to be the person who can like deliver the message. And so I think that in terms of both thinking about out what the most important, like the easiest way to make people, to make sure people knew like she is okay, she is in Windsor, but also that she really is going through something intense and would, had a reason to be away for as long as she did. I think that, you know, that there were a lot of different competing ideas, but it seems to be the way that Kate does like to deal with these things in other situations. Yeah, Erin, I wonder if you could give us a bit more context on sort of the role that Kate Middleton played uh, in the royal family. And you say that she was out quite a bit in 2023. Give us a sense. I mean, um, her absence then in 2024, this year so far, uh, how much attention did that initially draw? Well, so Kate, um, unlike, you know, she's not like Princess Anne, who is, you know, does three, four, five different engagements every single day. But what she does is that she has a couple of charities that she founded or, or works really closely with. And she will spend, you know, her engagements always make a lot of sense together. They tell a story. Um, her outfits are, you know, her, she's always thinking really, you know, is she going to be playing a sport? Is she going to be getting down on the ground? Like she really puts a lot of care into each one of those engagements. And so the pictures are just like always really stunning. And so you get used to seeing Kate doing a lot of, she becomes the, she's like the, you know, the kind of the heart and soul of the Royal family. She's not the person who's doing every engagement, but she is the person who, when she's out, she attracts eyes. And I think at first it didn't really make too much of a difference because they usually take a lot of time off um, around Christmas. It's like the Royals always spend the Christmas season up in Sandringham. They have a house up there. So at first it wasn't so strange. But then I think once it was the time where, you know, we did see Camilla going out, we have seen Anne, we have seen Sophie, like people have been doing international trips. Mm -hmm. That's when the absence of Kate became really obvious. And, and do you think, Aaron, at this point, we might hear more from the palace? Or do you think with the release of this video, I mean, I suppose there's no way to tell, but um, certainly this disclosure 
inevitably will lead to even more questions and has led to, to more questions as sort of follow ups to what already was disclosed. Yeah, I think it's almost too early to tell just because uh, if if, you know, the reports that have been coming out from palace staffers kind of speaking independently for the last couple of weeks is that both at Buckingham Palace and at Buckingham Palace and King Kensington Palace, they the staffers didn't know what was going on. Mm. They didn't know any too much more than we did. And so I think before we figure out sort of how the rest of the family is going to respond, I think it is just taking a minute for everybody to like learn that information sure. and kind of catch up and then, you know, and check in with William and Catherine and see what it is that they you know, most want and how they could be supported during this period. So I think, you know, the the palace is a very complicated institution and we're just kind of seeing the gears st spring into motion with this. Yeah, it is certainly a, a moment, though, uh, to to really kind of uh, reflect upon, because we certainly have never had this level of disclosure in this way, right, in, in the history uh, of the royals. Uh, for there to be this level of disclosure uh, is sort of remarkable in and of itself. And we begin with that major revelation from the royal family. Kate Middleton, the Princess of Wales, has been diagnosed with cancer and is undergoing chemotherapy. Now, this comes after weeks of speculation about her whereabouts since she was hospitalized in January for abdominal surgery. The 42-year-old royal hasn't been seen publicly since Christmas until a video surfaced this week of her and her husband, Prince William. We'll have more on the medical side of this story in just a moment, but we start first with Charlie Daggett from Buckingham Palace. A stunning public address about a very private matter following weeks of speculation about Kate's well-being and whereabouts after that surgery back in January. And the cruel conspiracy theories on social media, especially after that family photo Kate had to apologize for badly photoshopping a couple of weeks ago. She hopes that with this announcement, that a lot of that social media, wild stuff on social media and some of the more um, insensitive media coverage will dampen down, will quieten down. That is very much their hope. To the world, she's Catherine, the Princess of Wales. But firstly, a 42-year-old mother of three young children, Prince George, 10, Princess Charlotte, 8, and Prince Louis, just five which is why they timed the announcement to today's Easter break when the children are off school for a few weeks. Palace sources tell CBS News she's already begun the early stages of a course of preventative chemotherapy. They won't say what type of cancer or exactly when she was diagnosed, and they've made clear they won't be sharing that information. But it comes on the heels of King Charles's cancer announcement in early February. And she finished by adding there was another reason she wanted to share the news. And Charlie joins us now from outside of Buckingham Palace. Charlie, you mentioned that there was so much speculation. Everybody seemed to have an opinion about the princess prior to this announcement. What are you hearing there now as the public reacts to the news? Well, Lana, it's, it's not an exaggeration and it's not a lazy description to say that the nation will be in a state of shock tonight. You know, the information was released to us just a few minutes before the 6 o'clock news here. That's the news that everybody watches in the evening. That was intentional. And there's been so much speculation since January. So we had this major abdominal surgery. Then she sort of disappeared. And everybody's saying, well, where is she? Uh, why aren't we seeing her? Why won't the palace put her forward? And then there was that, that badly photoshopped photo and uh, family photo, which was meant to allay fears during Mother's Day. And mm -hmm. people have been asking questions. And you know what the tabloids are like here? You know, you've been here yourself. They're so, so aggressive. And they're saying, what is the palace uh, trying to hide? But there are very few people who would have expected that it was going to be a cancer diagnosis. Remember, this is a 42-year-old woman, um, you know, with young kids. She always ranks as one of the most popular royals. So I guarantee you, over the course of the next few days, the next few weeks, everybody will turn from what is the palace trying to hide into is Kate going to be okay? Yeah. All right. Charlie Daggett, thank you. Thank you. Our chief medical correspondent, Dr. John LaPook, joins us now here in Studio 57. So good to see you. So there's a lot of questions, and I think the biggest one right now is what type of cancer does she have? Obviously, even though she revealed a lot in that video, she chose to keep that private. Is there a reason, perhaps, why she's not sharing that yeah. information? I think this is an age-old situation, right, with well-known people 
where you're trying to have their sense of privacy protected. And she's a mother and she's a human being. She's a person and she's entitled to her privacy. On the other hand, she's on a world stage and people are very curious about what's going on. I think what was interesting to me when they said that um, it, was, it was found after the surgery, right. right, in testing. And what it said to me, what it implied to me, was that maybe this has been diagnosed at a very early stage. Because you think about it, it was planned surgery. So if it was planned surgery, they must have done CAT scans beforehand or similar MRIs, things like that. Then they go into the operating room and they're looking into her abdominal cavity and they're looking at it. So if there's any obvious cancer there, they should see it. They didn't see it there. Didn't see it on the scans, didn't see it in the operating room. Then they said it was found in, in testing done afterwards. So they don't say exactly what that is. I assume one thing it could have been is they had a surgical specimen, they sliced it open, they looked under the microscope, and they said, oh, there's some cancer cells, what a surprise. And to me, that means that, well, on the one hand, you hate to hear that it was cancer, but on the other hand, if she does have to have cancer, finding it at its, at its early a stage as possible is, is what you want to do because that's the stage where it's most potentially curable. Well, and they, and they described it as preventative treatment. So that's different. It's a very okay. confusing term, right? So what, when they say preventative chemo, it's confusing because it's the same as adjuvant chemo. It's not preventing the cancer. She already has the cancer. What it's preventing is if there are microscopic little cells that are already in her body somewhere, we can't see them, we can't measure them, Giving chemo now, when they're most vulnerable, we can maybe kill those cells before they have a chance to grow up, form clumps, form metastases, spread to other parts of the body. Once they've spread to other parts of the body, it's really tough to treat them at that stage. So what you're preventing is preventing those potentially, we don't know that they're there, but pre pre preventing any cells that happen to be there mm -hmm. from, from getting bigger and spreading. Well, it seems like such a, a nuclear option, chemotherapy, right? Um, but... Uh, but as, as we heard, these are the, this is the early stages, according um, to that statement. Well, let me, let me interrupt when you said nuclear, yeah. right? Because people, I think, are quite frightened of, of chemo. And, and, and I know, you know, it, it can be very frightening to even think that you have to of get course. it. But when you have adjuvant, it tends to be for several months. For colon cancer, for example, it's about three months. And you have the chemotherapy, and you may have some fatigue, and you may have some nausea, decreased appetite. But generally, once the chemo is over... Um, you tend to return towards normal. So is it more targeted? Is it different from what, what well, we it, have in our minds about chemotherapy? Right. Well, I think it's the length and the strength of the chemo. You know, when you're doing adjuvant chemo, it tends to be a limited, you know, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end, and that, that may be about three months. It could be a little bit longer. Uh, when you think about people being on chemo for months and months and months and on and on right. and on, and on, then you start getting into bigger uh, side effects. You can have neuropathy, you know, problems mm -hmm. with your nerves, on and on and on. I'm not trying to minimize this. You know, she has a diagnosis of cancer. It must be frightening as anything for her. Um, she's getting chemotherapy. We associate chemotherapy with something super serious, which it is. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if this was found early, and if they're doing the chemotherapy really as sort of belt and suspenders, you know, it's possible that the cancer is all out of her body, but just in case there are some cells there, let's give some chemotherapy. All right. Long road ahead still. Dr. John LaPook, thank you. And after weeks of public speculation over her health and whereabouts, Kate Middleton, Princess of Wales, revealed in a video Friday that she is being treated for cancer. CBS News royal contributor Amanda Foreman joins me now. A very emotional video while still being appropriately restrained, Amanda. Was the princess really forced to put out this video based off of the public speculation and rumors that we've heard so at such a strong drumbeat recently? Oh, yes. Yeah. So the... the the speculation had reached such a point that the day before yesterday, the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, the, the highest um, prelate of the country, the, um, the Archbishop himself had now weighed into it and said that the public needed to leave her alone. So it had reached such a fever pitch that the palace felt that now was the time. Yeah, and, uh, and other things that they tried to do before that seemed to all backfire. The edited video, or the edited photo, rather, um, on, uh, on Mother's Day. All of it sort of bred additional mistrust that we heard being expressed from the public and from the media. This seems to be an effort to repair that. Do you think that it will work? Oh, and yeah. would it have been better just to have, have said that, that she was battling cancer from the beginning and asked for that? privacy and respect? Well, the, the problem is that um, there, there was a tension between what the palace normally does and protocol and then a human being. 
and a mother with three small children. Right. And we've been told that um, William and Kate wanted to wait until the children had finished school so they wouldn't have to go to school each day. Um, the youngest is five, eight, and then the oldest is 10. And uh, they, they didn't want them to face their peers. And, and school ended. And that's why they made the announcement now. It's, it's so... Um normal in a way, right, uh, that a family, that their first consideration would be for their children. But in so many ways, we think of the royals as not just regular human beings, but as, as something separate and apart. Um, do you expect that, that this will then, given the confession that she's, that she's dealing with this, that this is difficult for her and her family, and that, that we, she just needs privacy and the ability to concentrate on getting better. Do you expect that now some of the vitriol uh, will be gone, that people will really leave her alone, or will there be more questions about what type of cancer is it, how is she doing, and, and the palace will feel the need to give more, more information? The general feeling is that the Internet has to grow up, and mm. this is the moment when it has to do that. that for the last six, eight weeks, there's been a lot of finger-pointing at Kate and William in particular, and Kate because of the photograph. And tomorrow is going to be the time when the finger-pointers get the finger pointed at them for being so mean and cruel, starting with the comedian Stephen Colbert, all the way down to the smallest internet troll who claimed that Kate was really dead, that uh, the marriage had fallen apart, you know, endless rumors. And now the world feels very ashamed and, and people have already started posting apologies, beginning with the actress Blake Lively, who had published a, she had posted a, a, a photograph making fun of the photograph fail and she apologized for that. And because of course, if anybody had really known the truth, they wouldn't have done it. But then who needs to know the truth when it's a mother and has three small children? Yeah, but what a lovely reminder that that if you make a mistake, you apologize. Yeah, you right. own it. Amanda Foreman, thank you. Welcome. And we want to note that The Late Show with Stephen Colbert is owned by CBS parent company Paramount.